Welcome to the Korea Society and welcome to Studio Korea. My name is Nikita Desai, Director of Policy and Corporate Programs at the Korea Society. Today's program builds on a continuing series of Korea as host and hub. And tonight's discussion is going to take a look at the Green Korea financing and legal aspects of the Green Climate Fund, which is cited in Songdo, Korea. I'm pleased to welcome our two guests today, Granville Martin of J.P. Morgan Chase. He's the Executive Director of Environmental Affairs, and John Sohn, attorney in the Environmental Group of McKenna Long and Aldridge. Granville Martin joined J.P. Morgan in 2005 to manage environmental risk, develop new business with a nexus to environmental protection, and analyze energy and environmental policy trends that have an impact on J.P. Morgan clients and businesses. He leads environmental due diligence effort on the oil gas industry with a particular focus on clients engaged in horizontal dr drilling and hydraulic fracturing. He has worked in the governor's Pataki's office on environmental issues and represented the financial services forum prior to joining J.P. Morgan and Chase. John Sohn, he's an experienced climate change, energy and natural resources public policy leader. He advises a range of clients on energy, climate change, and sustainability matters. His clients include shale gas production companies, renewable energy independent power producers, foreign governments, emerging clean tech companies, and financial institutions. Prior to joining McKenna Long and Aldridge, Mr. Sohn worked at Climate Change Capital, Capital, where he helped develop their global environmental and social risk management policy and advised their investment funds on carbon markets and clean energy policy. He has also worked at the World Resources Institute and International Finance Corporation on environmental and social, risk, uh, uh, social risks and opportunities. Um, please give these two wonderfully expert uh, guests a big round of applause for joining us today. <laughs> so a year ago at the Korea Society, we hosted Frank Schroeder uh, from the Climate Change Support Team uh, at the Office of UN Secretary General, who talked about Korea and the hosting of the uh, climate Green Climate Fund in Songdo, Korea. So what has changed? How has it really evolved in the last year? If you could talk to us about that. Sure, Nikita. Well, first of all, thanks to the Korea Society for having me here today. And um, uh, my uh, colleague Song Jong is on the board of the Korea Society, so I'm sending along good wishes for him and from him as well. And um, really, the Green Climate Fund's come a long way in a very short period of time. Uh, in 2009, um, in Copenhagen, the uh, uh, um, uh, an international target was set to um, uh, have a uh, hundred billion dollars a year by 2020 uh, of climate um, fi finance uh, annually um, be raised by developing co developed countries to go towards developing countries. And um, subsequently, through to 2011, the Green Climate Fund was set up under the UN climate negotiations to be one multilateral vehicle uh, to help fulfill that goal. Uh, uh, and that money is supposed to be both public and private money towards that goal. And really, in the last year, the, uh, the, the Green Climate Fund has really begun to take form. Uh, so we see sort of the shell of the fund um, uh, has come into place. Uh, a lot of the business model in terms of the overall outline of it has come into place. We have an executive director. The uh, Songdo is now home to the fund. Um, we have advisory committees set up. Some of the beginnings of a staff is in place. Um, and initial pledging has now been approved under the UN uh, Conference of the Parties process. Um, so a lot of the direction comes from that process and the board of the fund, which is made up of a variety of members, both from developing and developed countries to the fund, um, are setting the direction of the fund. So a lot of the, the structural issues that have to happen for the fund to get towards a real business model and a true capital raising uh, phase of the fund are now uh, in place, and now those two big prongs of capital raising and a business model are are set to go in the coming year. Okay, great. So speaking of capital, I'll, I'll turn now to Granville. What does a bank like J.P. Morgan Chase want to see um, from GCF? What what needs to happen for private sector involvement or engagement? 
Sure. Well, let me echo what, what John said. Thanks for the, the invitation. And um, Korea is a very important market um, to the bank. Uh, and um, in fact, Jamie Dimon was just uh, in Korea uh, a month or two ago. Um, he goes every year. Um, so, you know, the GCF has a lot of promise. Um, you know, funding pledges are going to be obviously important, and that's going to come from, from principally national governments. Um, like other multilateral uh, institutions, uh, private sector entities often participate side by side uh, in, in e either project finance or on a portfolio basis. And, um, you know, what makes that attractive? You know, the GCF is going to need a, a clear business plan, um, you know, project selection process that is uh, crisp enough to keep private sector actors uh, interested and focused in, in participating in a particular uh, transaction. Um, and uh, uh, really a, a private sector focus that institutions like the IFC and some of the multilaterals um, do a great job of, of embodying. Um, you know, th those multilateral institutions when they go to market, they don't have any trouble selling their selling their papers. So obviously, the credit rating of the of the entity is critically important. Um, and uh, whether or not investors are being asked to take project specific risk uh, or portfolio risk is going to be uh, uh, a you know a distinction that that matters enormously. Uh, it, it may turn out that uh, it will be easier um, uh, for investors get comfortable taking balance sheet uh, risk as opposed to project risk. Um, you know, project finance, which is something that, that J.P. Morgan does not do a lot of, just takes an awful lot of underwriting expertise uh, and uh, manpower. Uh, so that, that, by definition, will exclude a fair number of, of financial investors. So um, I guess the last thing I'd say is... Uh, it's sort of the bureaucratic complexity that gets presented or created here is going to matter a lot uh, to the private sector. And, uh, um, you know, from time to time, some things that the uh, international community um, creates are pretty complicated. So bureaucratic complexity when it comes to operating or dealing with multinational uh, entities like the GCF, or it could also be government-led bureaucracy in the individual countries that they're trying to institute projects. Yeah, I think there's a lot of different ways that that kind of complexity can get created. <clears throat> and it doesn't necessarily, uh, you know, come from whatever rules around financial participation. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, on that point, there's, um, th there's a, a board of, of, of 24 different countries that um, the executive director and the staff of the Green Climate Fund have to answer to. And so as they set up uh, a process to do capital raising on the one hand and a business model on the other uh, and a set of uh, directions from the UN uh, climate change negotiation processes. Um, there's a lot of different agendas um, on rules around transparency and safeguards and how much of the money should go towards adaptation projects or programs. Uh, and how much should go towards mitigation and which countries should be in line first. And all, there's a whole host of potential issues that go with all that and a lot of people that want their priorities to be met. And so, you know, threading the eye of the needle on that is no small task. Uh, and raising capital all the while while you're doing all that. So, I mean, I don't envy that task. It's a, it's a difficult one. Um, but, you know, doing all that and avoiding bureaucracy is a real challenge. But, uh, and then at the end of that, coming out of that and saying, we're going to do transformative projects and not just one solar project here and one wind project here, but really transformative things that are going to mitigate climate change uh, and reduce greenhouse gases at a scale that's really necessary and, and deliver capital in a way that's really transformative, um, is, it's a real big challenge and the GCF really needs to be a part of that. So how can a project really be transformative? Are there some examples you can give of, you know, in the past or, or 
you know, in terms of private, public-private engagement or partnerships? Well, I mean, I, I would I would think about it like this. Um, um, you can put up. Uh, what would it take to um, do um, a whole suite of um, uh, electrification of of um, the automotive sector in a in a given country? Mm. Um, what would it take to make that happen? It, you know, it, it's not just about um, dumping a bunch, exporting a bunch of, of electric cars from the United States to a country and saying go at it, right? It's not just saying Detroit, send over a bunch of cars. Uh, it's about all the infrastructure and all the programs and all the policies and all the training and everything that goes with that to make that happen. Mm. And that's a whole lot of expertise and a whole lot of capital and it's a lot of different types of capital that have to make that happen. Mm -hmm. So that's just one example. And so what role can the GCF play mm. in, in helping to make that happen? And what other private sector capital can they leverage to make that sort of activity happen? I don't know, Granville, do you have any Thoughts yeah, on that? I, I, every country's there's not going to be a, a, a single paradigm that works in every country, and I, I think one of the challenges that the GCF has is setting expectations. You know, energy, energy systems and energy policy they change really slowly, um, and the GCF and it the people who are and the in the governments that are participating with it, we all need to be realistic about what the what the time frame is to affect meaningful change. And so with respect to how can the GCF work catalytic change, it needs to pick a particular sector in a particular country and stay there for a while. If you look at the creation of uh, distributed generation markets in the U.S., companies like Solar City and Sunrun, you know, those, those guys have recently achieved scale in the last couple of years, but they've been at it for seven or eight years, and there are some companies that were trying to do it before them that failed, um, and now they've picked up the mantle and are exploiting these markets. It takes a while, and I think it is, um, I know that the, the, the GCF, I believe, is, is supposed to sort of get its administrative house in order over the next year and go out and, and raise, raise money. And I certainly, you know, applaud their efforts to do that. But they may need more time to, to get this right. And I, and I think that there ought to be real expectations um, in 2016 about jumping to ju jump leaping to judgment about whether or not they've been effective. Mm -hmm. Well, there's certainly a lot of challenges ahead. Uh, what are the legal, what is the legal, international legal framework that you see with the GCF? And what do you see ahead for the GCF? Well, I mean, the GCF takes its direction from the UN uh, process uh, and, and its board. So that's that's th that's where they operate, and they have the World Bank as a uh, interim trustee as well. So that's sort of the the legal framework that within the, which they operate. And then looking down the line, um, there's a, a hope and a goal to have a, a global uh, climate change agreement uh, in 2015 in in Paris. And one would think that part of that agreement would be seeing some real advancements in where the GCF is um, uh, as part of the overarching goal of um, uh, developed countries demonstrating that they're advancing the, the idea of meeting the 2020 targets for $100 billion a year in, um, uh, in climate finance. So I think the GCF is a real part of the, the good faith demonstration of that that objective. So they're going to have to, I think they're under some pressure to really show some advancement in their business model and their capital raising efforts. And um, so it's, it's all the administrative and um, business model processes that they're going to have to just step by step advance to show that progress. Well, that's great. Um, are there any final comments that you'd like to add before we turn to Q&A? Just that, you know, it's like I said, it's, it's, it's going to take a little while. And um, there's a lot of areas that are separate from putting up a windmill or building a natural gas plant that, that are obstacles to building mitigation. And it would be terrific if the GCF found a way to participate in bringing down some of those barriers in different countries. If you look at the cost of permitting solar, in the US, the cost, the soft cost, aside from the panels and the engineering and the installation, they're all over the map. 
And, you know, compared to what the Germans cost, what transaction costs are in Germany, we're like 10x what it costs in Germany to do that. And I would imagine that there's a lot of those disparities around the world and how GCF can play a productive role in addressing really boring, esoteric stuff that no one's ever going to get a front page FT article about is really important. Yeah, I would just say that, I mean, I, I was in uh, Songdo in, uh, in early December of, of last year for the uh, ceremony opening the GCF, and I would just say how impressed I was with the, the, the staff that the GCF uh, um, has in place already and the new executive director and, and um, how exciting it was uh, for the people of Korea to have this new fund there. And um, there's a lot of momentum in, in, in Songdo. And um, I think um, sitting here in Washington, I'm sorry, in New York, you know, uh, it, 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 it's hard to feel the tangibility of that, but it really was a, a big moment in Korea and so um, I just think that, you know, we, it's important for the Korea Society to, to recognize that. Well, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll now open up to q and A. I Please ask if you identify yourself uh, and your affiliation. We have two mics. Brave one over here. Hi. I think it's on. Hi, this is uh, Divya at TrueCost. I'm a vice president and uh, work with a lot of uh, financial institutions who are looking at environmental risk. And one of the positive stories of the last year has been the massive growth in green bonds investing with over a billion dollars from the IFC that was oversubscribed and similarly from Bank of America that was also oversubscribed. I was curious if you see a shift in investors being um, uh, looking at risk differently in climate investments and if that parallels growth with uh, appetite for investing in the GCF once it finally gets uh, sort of off the ground. Well, you're quite right. The green bond market and JP Morgan was one of the four institutions that, that developed the green bond principles that were announced uh, last week at the UN. Um, the green bond market has grown uh, quite a bit over the last year and the expectations are it'll grow uh, more in 2014. I mean, the what what you see is an expansion in investor interest into uh, groups of investors that previously hadn't really expressed a lot of preference for climate investments, and I think there's a there's a couple reasons for that. But green bonds allow investors to have an environmental impact. Um, and not give up any of the other uh, market returns uh, or uh, soundness that they get, uh, you know, by buying multilateral paper um, or perhaps large corporates at an investment grade rating. So um, we think that's going to continue. Whether the GCF can participate in something like that. If you look at the green bond principles, green bonds are defined, you know, simply as project, you know, uh, bonds that finance projects that are environmentally beneficial. So one would certainly hope that what the GCF is financing would qualify uh, on that basis. The principles impose uh, um, certain reporting requirements, but I, I would imagine that the GCF would be uh, would easily meet some of those transparency requirements. So I think it's, I think there's a good synergy there. Yeah, I would just add uh, another interesting new new player in the in the green bond market at a significant scale is Zurich Insurance. That's so another oh, another interesting company to watch on that. And, and I think the, the the GCF's role in that is just remains to be seen. It's largely about these business model issues and the flexibility that the GCF is allowed and whether that's the route they they choose. But it's certainly something that's probably on the table. Yes, another question over here. Tesla, the automobile company, is <coughs> getting a certain amount of publicity for a prototype that, uh, that they hope will be transformative and will be a major consumer of certain types of energy and could be transformative in a way. Do they enter your orbit at all, a private 
company like this? Um, you know, uh, Tesla is a client of the bank. Um, they, uh, you know, have been a, a really successful uh, company to date. Um, you know, I think just, you know, speaking personally, not for JP Morgan, uh, you know, the electrification of the, of the transportation sector provided the baseload power is reasonably green is something I think we all ought to welcome. You know, whether or not, um, you know, they will be the, uh, you know, a sustained market leader, you know, I, I wish I knew. <laughs> Question back there. Hi, I'm Nick Jones. I'm with the University of London. My question is, where is the money going to come from for the Green Climate Fund? And in, say, five years' time, how much money could it realistically be implementing? Thank you. Sure. Well, I mean, that's the, I don't know how many billion dollar question, but that's the question, right? I and mean, so uh, they, they've just been, uh, I'm sorry, the GCF has just been emboldened to go out and, and raise capital to get started. And I think they have sort of modest short-term goals to get going. And um, I don't, I don't want to put a dollar figure on, on what that looks like over the short term. Um, but there will be a process, a UN-led process to, at a very sort of high, high level, heads of state level, if not finance minister level, to get pledges. Uh, Korea, which has, obviously has a, quite a vested interest in getting things moving, has already made a, an initial $40 million pledge just to get some administrative things moving. And I think over the next year, you will see uh, pledges moving forward. I think the challenges for governments, if you just look here in the United States, uh, as an example, is where does the, the money come from, from an appropriations perspective? Um, does it get shifted uh, from a traditional appropriations? Is it new and additional money? Uh, is it, um, you know, do you look at sunsetting other climate activities? Uh, or transferring money. It's those sorts of discussions that have to occur in capitals around the world. Um, do you look at alternative ways of raising capital from you know, new sources? Um, there's a whole host of ways you could go about doing this. I think there's also a question of, you know, um, can the GCF have the flexibility to raise capital outside of traditional you know, public money? Can it, can it somehow partner with private sector capital in innovative ways to raise money that way or work with, you know, the philanthropic money. I mean, I think those sorts of issues might be on the table as well. I think we're still need to figure out all that. And you know, that's a that's a um, figuring out ways to leverage private money is something that a lot of state green banks in the U.S. are now trying to do. And I, I think that the there has a been a realization uh, throughout developed economies that being a direct financier or direct lender is probably not the wisest use of scarce public dollars because of the scale necessary uh, to affect this transition. So um, hopefully what we'll see are uh, structures that uh, rely on credit enhancement, uh, loan loss reserves, things that are going to bail in private capital uh, to achieve these mitigation ends. Mr. Hong, back there. Any one of them. Any similar thing going on in China? I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to. A similar uh, thing as in what? On this uh, green bond, uh, the thing, environmental well, thing. I, I think this uh, green climate fund is uh, international, right? It's it's a multilateral entity with right. pledges from all governments across the board. Uh, do you know anything particular of the Chinese governments? Well, I mean, I think China's actively involved in the UN process and certainly is looking at the GCF and other opportunities as well. But There's a Chinese member of the board, I believe, isn't yeah. there? The way, as you may know, um, why I bring up the China issue is uh, we get this uh, polluting particles flying over the Yellow Sea now, not only Korea, it comes to the west coast of the United States. So... In terms of a global point of view, and a small country like a Korea can do it the best, but unless a big guy over there really comes serious about this thing is, then I don't know how effective, cost effectivity is going to be. 
Well, let me be clear, sir. The 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 fund itself is housed in uh, in Songdo in Korea, but the investments are intended to be uh, much more um, internationally developing country oriented than just. Uh, they're not supposed to, intended to be like focused on Korea themselves. They're supposed to be much more geographically diverse than that and to address a much broader set of uh, greenhouse gas emissions or adaptation activities uh, globally than that. You know, the the, um, the Chinese Banking Regulatory Commission has promulgated uh, green banking guidelines uh, that are intended to, uh, I don't know if impose is the right word, but to incorporate environmental uh, environmental priorities into the credit allocation process. I think it's early days yet to see how and whether that will be an effective way uh, to direct more capital to environmentally improving uh, activities. I think you know it's not it's not clear. There was an article in the FT today, interestingly. Um, regarding a, uh, a a Chinese investment vehicle that essentially repackaged loans from a uh, Chinese coal company, and that has gone into distress. It's not clear what the ultimate resolution of this investment vehicle is going to be. But I bring it up because everybody here knows the big air pollution problems that China is having. But to the extent that that specific coal companies, that the loans that it took out are impaired because of government environmental policy, the decision to improve the air and therefore burn less coal, that's an interesting and I think probably unwelcome uh, realization. Um, and so I, I think there are a lot of very complicated uh, national environmental regulatory questions that the GCF is going to have to deal with when it looks at a specific country and a specific project. Uh, so, which kind of goes back to my point about how long it's going to take to have an effect. These are really complicated uh, issues. And um, I think that deliberation is probably the better part of valor here. Their goal yeah. is 2020, right? right. Is well, that a realistic goal given what uh, Granville's just said well I mean the goal is a is a is a, a money goal right but that's not a you know there's you can you it's a it's really a push-pull uh, issue right mm -hmm. I mean you can you can set targets for developed countries to put money towards developing countries towards climate finance but you and you can uh, and you can fulfill those targets but you also need to Work in partnership and 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 build uh, programs and policies uh, in developing countries and here at home uh, that set policy certainty for the long term that um, uh, you're going to reduce emissions uh, and that and that takes a lot of work and that's the that's the harder part in my view I mean the the money the the, the money can come. Uh, and uh, it's not easy to, to shake it out of governments. I don't want to dismiss that, but the money can come, particularly the private capital can come, but you really need to get those policies and, and, and uh, policy certainty in place, and that takes a lot of work too. I think that's the point Granville's trying to make at the end of the day here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the U experience of the European Union's emission trading scheme, you know, we had certainty, right? You know, they, they put a carbon price uh, in place, and the carbon price was too low. And so it didn't really materially change the carbon intensity of the European economy. There are a lot of things going on in the background, but it's an example of there's a policy. It was clear. They didn't really monkey around with it a little bit, but by and large, it was consistent over a five, seven year period. And it didn't really move the needle. So it wasn't really about money. You know, I mean, European utilities are, you know, they were, they could raise money. And um, how you get the policy right, I think, is a more determining feature than whether or not the capital is available. Because the capital is available. David, did you have a question? 
Hi, sorry, a second question <laughs> uh, from Divya at TrueCost. I was curious, as uh, countries contribute to the GCF and uh, sort of intermediaries in the form of banks are either underwriting or also getting involved with the transformative projects that it seeks to um, implement, does it have knock-on effects on the other sorts of uh, financial aid given by those countries or lending being done <coughs> by those banking institutions. So, for example, if you're um, investing in a new transportation uh, sector in a, in a country, are you then lessening your um, investment in uh, other kinds of uh, automobile companies or, or that sector? Is there some sort of portfolio balancing that happens or do you see that kind of tension happening yeah you know I, I don't do sovereign risk so um i wouldn't think so i mean you know obviously you can't go from zero to infinity but um uh, you know this will be you know in, in an environment in a context of, of of you know expanding economic growth you know it's easier to to, to make decisions you know I, there's so many factors that go into you know what your risk appetite is i think it's hard to to answer the question without you know a specific uh transaction or portfolio um sitting in front of you question over here Hi, my name's Andrew Friedman. Uh, I'm an advisor at the Palau Mission here in New York. Um, thank you both uh, for providing your expertise today. Uh, my question is about small island states and least developed countries. I'm sure this is something that the board has probably been wrestling with behind the scenes, but uh, these are some countries that are obviously at greatest risk um, facing the effects of climate change. At the same time, they're in the weakest position uh, to leverage capital um, to mitigate its effects. Um, and really in these countries, when we're talking about mitigation, we're talking not about leveraging opportunities, but avoiding catastrophe. Uh, so my question is, um, even at its early stages, uh, what sort of options is the fund exploring uh, for creatively addressing these mitigation issues um, at the very high-end risk of the, uh, the climate change spectrum? Well, I, I actually uh, would consider it more of an adaptation issue than a, a mitigation issue. The, you know, when you're talking about small island states and the climate risks that are being faced, I mean, um, yeah, some of it could be about mitigation and resilient power systems and that sort of stuff, but a lot of it's about just being able to absorb the blows of inevitable uh, extreme weather events and that sort of thing. And when I'll, I, you know, I'm not in the deliberations of the board, so I can't, uh, I can't speak exactly to that. But I know that the direction that that's coming out of the the UN process and the dialogue I hear around the the, the GCF and, and in the UN negotiations, certainly uh, the small island states are being heard in those discussions when it comes to funding and adaptation and some, you know, portion of the money, uh, you know, being directed towards those, you know, those countries. And, um, you know, I don't, I, I know it's a problem and I know the voice being heard is a real challenge and I, uh, I share your concern, and so you know I think it's a real issue, um, but I, I think it's it's certainly on the table. Um, but you know, you know, I, it's a, it's a problem. But I mean, I, well, I can say when I was over in Songdo, it was a it was a consistent drumbeat of that issue being brought up from a lot of different stakeholders. One more question. Hi, um, I had a. Point of clarification first, which is um, the Green Climate Fund, are we talking about grants or loans? And are we talking about exclusively to the private sector or to the, the um, sorry, exclusively to the public or to the private sector as well? And following on from that, um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on the kind of financial approaches you're talking about, which are the most promising options for leveraging in private capital for a given amount of funding? What are the best kind of approaches that the GCF can be considering? 
I'll, I'll I'll take the first part of that, and maybe I'll have the Granville ask Granville to chime in on the second. I mean, the I think the fund is going to have a public, a strong public element, which is uh, about concessional loans and grants primarily, and um, that could be direct, you know, direct aid, traditional aid types of projects, uh, um, and and prob generally about public money, and and um, that could go out in in a number of different ways. But I would think about it as traditional, you know, grants and concessional finance or concessional loans is probably a better way to put it. Um, and then, then it's going to have a private sector window, and uh, that's more about you know the types of issues we've been talking about here in this conversation, um, and you know the mechanisms and tools of that private sector when uh, private sector window uh, of the GCF remain to be fully uh, identified and. Uh, I think will become more um, uh, more come more into focus over the next six months to a year. Um, so that's that's generally how it's going to be worked out. But it um, that's the general structure of it at this point. Um, it really depends on what you're we're going to try to finance. Uh, to the extent that the the GCF is going to look at specific projects and attempt to finance specific projects. Um, as I said earlier, uh, J.P. Morgan doesn't do a, a tremendous amount of, of project finance, uh, but if that is the approach, the GCF is going to want to arrive at structures that can de-risk the transaction. So is there a way for the GCF to uh, provide guarantees around, uh, around project risk? Uh, is there a way for the GCF um, to take first loss uh, in order to incent private capital uh, to come in? Um, if the GCF is taking a, uh, a broader corporate finance uh, approach, whether or not the GCF could partner with another uh, multilateral agency, um, for some sort, or, or a, a, a donate, or a, a financing government for some kind of guarantees, uh, that would of course make uh, private sector capital uh, more available. But I think it's going to depend in what uh, John sort of started out with. What is the business plan for the GCF? And once we understand that, then we can get to some of these other very important questions uh, about how to make the best use. Uh, the limited capital that they're going to have. I think that's all the time we have for Q&A. Um, our speakers will be here for a few minutes if you'd like to ask them some questions or have any comments for them. Uh, please join me in thanking both of them for an excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, we have a lot of a lot of you who are not members in the audience here from you know UN entities and World Bank and so forth. We'd really encourage you to join us as members. Uh, if you're interested in business and politics, uh, please join us back on February 10th. We have Victor Cha talking about winter games from Sochi to Pyeongchang. Um, and after that, on February 20th, we'll be talking about startups and entrepreneurship and innovation in Korea. So please join us back. Thank you all for coming today. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.